Hundreds of thousands of men, women and children are maimed and killed every year by light arms, often trafficked illegally or even openly in a grey area of near legality used by governments to sponsor armed factions. This is the story of how individuals and states have profited from the civil wars around the Mediterranean's shores. Wars that have flooded the heart of Europe with their refugees, with terrorists and their weapons. Today, arms are being trafficked in and out of the Mediterranean and Black Sea ports and airports by smugglers, arms dealers, and even governments. There is a grey area between legal and illegal trade that bends the rules to allow the arms industries, states, and individuals to profit from conflicts where, despite arms embargoes in place, human rights are violated daily. For most transfers of arms, the entry certificate is okay um, because most of these arms have a legitimate end use. But you know there's always a problem of diversion of these weapons. One thing that we've noticed and one thing that we've targeted recently, and actually this method started uh, in Africa, is targeting what we call the super facilitators. A Serbian prime minister told me at the press conference that he adores when he sells arms. The tranquil city of Brussels, capital of Belgium and the heart of the European Union, is also a thriving hub for the small arms trade. It has been a hotbed of Islamic terrorist activity too. By a strange twist of history, the ingredients of an explosive cocktail of crime and terrorism came together here in 2016. We have uh, generations of firearms production knowledge, which is, being which is being transferred from generation to generation. And people know that if you have guns and you want to do something with it, go to the people with the expertise. And this is interesting, when you see that some of the weapons used in the Paris attacks in 2015 were actually deactivated guns that got reactivated in Belgium. Brussels is also where the United States Department of Justice has located its European offices of the DEA, responsible over the past two decades for the arrest of two of the world's most notorious weapons traffickers. Especially Mr. Uh, 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 Al-Qasar uh, was in fact uh, what we uh, identify as a super facilitator. And he w was tied to both drug trafficking and he was tied to terrorist activity and arms sales. The merchants of death have always existed. Men such as Monser al qassar who made his fortune in the wars of the 1980s and 90s, covertly dealing with governments and rogue states. He was accused of supplying arms for the Somali warring factions allegedly in exchange for the disposal of toxic waste through the facade of a shipping company, Shifco, that operated out of Gaeta in Italy. Monza Alcazar was arrested in Spain in 2005 and extradited to the United States. When the Soviet Union collapsed in 1992, a combination of chaos, massive weapons stockpiles and criminal entrepreneurship allowed its massive arms machine to fall into the hands of notorious arms dealers. After the 20th of December, the Soviet Union disappears unexpectedly, and this new reality of Russia appears. But all the money has disappeared too. Some members of the Russian military turned their hands to arms smuggling. Viktor Boot was an ex-Air Force officer who used a fleet of aircraft to transport Soviet weapons and military material anywhere in the world. He was arrested in Bangkok and accused of plotting to kill American citizens, which enabled the United States to have him extradited back to the USA 
in 2010. We, we at the DEA target drug trafficking, and that's what we do. But if, if we stumble upon that these drug traffickers are also involved in terrorist activity, we obviously get our counterparts involved and we, and we go after these people uh, the best way we can. And many times because of some great laws in the United States that target terrorist organizations with ties to narco trafficking, we have a nice tool in our toolbox that we can charge these folks in the United States like we did with Mr. Boot and like we did with Mr. Kassar. What happened to the Soviet reserves? Paolo Tamponi investigated. We find this capital hidden around the world. And this capital was used to buy up cheap, very cheap. The Russian gas production industries, as it was explained to me. According to some, it was the military origin of some of these that helped them lay their hands on this industry. So the connection that becomes apparent, or became apparent at the time, between the gas pipelines of Russia and the arms trade was described to us. As the communist world collapsed, so did Yugoslavia. In 1994, the wars raging in former Yugoslavia absorbed weapons and ammunition in quantities that had never been seen on European soil since the Second World War. It was the year the Jadran Express container ship was stopped in the Straits of Otranto. We were investigating Russian organized crime. And after one thing led to another, we discovered what we might describe as a ghost company. In Turin, which is a city where I was working, managed by a Ukrainian person, a certain Dmitry Strashensky. Dmitry Strashensky was linked to the Jadron Express. Looking back today, it is possible to trace what happened to this one single lethal cargo that was destined for the Bosnian conflict zone and ended up through government intervention 20 years later in Iraq. As you know, the Jadran was stopped in the Adriatic Straits and taken to an Italian port, where the commander attempts to sink her. He fails, and this raises the suspicion of the investigators. And mixed in with containers full of copper wire and cotton bales, they found this enormous, I mean really enormous, cargo of weapons. The story Straczynski told Tamponi spotlighted the open sore that was the post-Soviet Union Eastern Bloc. The Jadron Express was just the last of 12 cargo ships headed to the Slovenian port of Kopa with arms for Croatia and Bosnia, countries under UN arms embargoes at the time. Jadran. The Jadran Express's intermediate port of call was the port of Venice. So the ship was to call in the port of Venice before proceeding to one of the ports of former Yugoslavia to supply the armies. This was enough and was sufficient to establish the jurisdiction of the Italian government. The investigation identified a Greek intermediary and two Russian nationals, Alexander Zuhov and Leonid Lebedev, as the dealers, who were also the owners of an oil trading company. The suspects had interests in a gas and oil company Sintes Oil. This led to the investigation extending to this company too. Zukov, Lebedev, all people who were extremely respected in Moscow. According to Ukrainian witnesses, 
the arms were destined for the Slovenian port of Kope, where they were to be delivered to Croatian and Bosnian middlemen for use in the civil war that was ongoing at the time. Nel corso del giudizio ordinario vennero portati dei testimoni. During the trial, Ukrainian witnesses appeared, government employed, who declared, and possibly rightly, but we did not know this beforehand, that the cargo was under surveillance. Che quel carico era stato sorvegliato. As a result of this, and of declarations made by the Ukrainian government personnel, it was discovered that the ship was not due to go via Italy. So, as a result of these declarations sworn under oath, the basis of Italian jurisdiction was eliminated. When they were first captured, the judicial authorities ordered the arms to be destroyed, and they were taken to the super-secret NATO naval base on the Sardinian island of La Maddalena, where they were stocked, but not destroyed. Where did all these weapons from Eastern Europe sail from? Until recently, one of the most notorious arms smuggling hotspots was the Ukrainian port of Odessa, as well as its secret twins, Oktyabrysk and Mykolaiv. Gas pipelines that end up in Odessa pass through the Ukraine, and the oil company was interested in controlling it. And obviously, having the gas go through had a cost, that was paid by a paying officer and a receiving officer, and within this was a deal to sell military material. But today, things are changing in Odessa. The unlikely new sheriff in town is Yulia Maruszewska. I became known on Maidan after the video um, about what was happening, I, like that was a very awful moment when, when first victims appeared, when uh, snipers started shooting at people and I wanted to tell the world about what was happening. The 26-year-old Euromaidan activist has campaigned for democracy and reform in Ukraine and now heads the customs service overseeing cargo traffic at the port. The most important uh, smuggling, that's the smuggling of the drugs, weapons, alcohol, tobacco, like real smuggling. That's also a huge problem and Odessa is a leader for that for sure because 65% of all goods that are coming to Ukraine, they're coming through Odessa. For the last year, she has had perhaps the hardest job in town. Reforming port operations and rooting out corruption, which is rife. Odessa is uh, a unique region for Ukraine, the biggest region uh, with the five seaports. It's huge, full of people. It's the biggest exporter of grain uh, with a, like, beautiful people, beautiful land, beautiful nature, beautiful sea coast, incredible beaches, but at the same time completely destroyed roads, no institution. Now Odessa is the only region actually the biggest region between Crimea, occupied by Russia, and Transnistria, occupied also, I would say, by, by Russia. She changed people, procedures, and protocols, ushering in a new automated system for clearing goods and simplified procedures, taking away the arbitrary power of individual customs officials to demand bribes and turn a blind eye on smuggled goods. Today, the port keeps a digital track of what is going where. But the project to improve transparency has faced stiff resistance. Customs is the most, one of the most corrupt areas. Like that's the place of the huge cash flow, that's a, a, a very corrupt institution. And to create this, you know, like island, 
like this clean island in, in this uh, lake of corruption, it's uh, really important for business. And this support is always with me. But on the other hand, of course, I have uh, people who are like uh, smugglers who couldn't work uh, in Odessa anymore. They just changed and went to other customs when they could, still can negotiate. In 2013, the Russians began sending heavy equipment to Syria on their own naval ships as well as cargo ships. And during 2015, they began buying up ships from Ukrainian and Turkish companies to convert them into transport vessels to supply their troops on the ground. Yulia still cannot see what weapons are going where because defense, interior and intelligence ministries are able to bypass her authority. As soon as something is um, happening with weapon smuggling, then the intelligence forces, they, they, are, um, they say that it's under our control and uh, the customs is kind of uh, being replaced from the, pro from the process. Uh, to control the um, smuggling of the weapons, that's, uh, a, you need a high secret clearance and uh, that's uh, the problem of the uh, national and international governments. But Western governments have also been found to have supplied weapons for the Syrian conflict. U.S. arms sold to Jordan have made their way into the hands of rebels. And the arms cache found aboard the Jadron Express was reported to have been delivered by the Italian government to the Kurdish militias fighting ISIL. The Italian government changed the law to make this trade possible, but has done nothing to track the arms' whereabouts. Erano armi per la dotazione di un armamento di un esercito moderno. They were weapons. They were equipment for a modern army. The arms confiscated were ordered to be taken away and destroyed. Also, because the arms were not of a type used by NATO, by which they could have been given to the forces that at that time were part of NATO, they were Kalashnikovs. So there was no economic interest in keeping them. Firearms are very durable goods. Some of the weapons that are being found right now in the Middle East, in the conflicts in the Middle East, are weapons that are dating back from the 50s or the 60s or the 70s. So these weapons have been around for decades and have changed hands for decades. And that's very difficult. But it also means you, when you do export control, you have to take the long-term perspective. The weapons that we're exporting today, where will they end up tomorrow? But you also have to ask yourself the question, where will they end up in five years or 10 years or 20 years? The Balkans Investigative Reporters Network and the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, NGOs supported by the European Union and, among others, the Norwegian and British foreign ministries, have investigated arms sales to Saudi Arabia. Their researchers have identified 68 cargo flights from ex-Soviet bloc countries supplying massive quantities of Soviet-designed arms to Syrian rebels, including ISIL, via apparently legal exports to Saudi Arabia and Jordan, arms that do not equip their regular armies. Those, those flights are cargo planes. Uh, aviation company is usually Rubistar that operates and that has the history of um, shifting, you know, usually weapons uh, to difficult and problematic countries, if I can say it like that, uh, in, in the past. So it's the same illusion flights that they were using um, these days and they are actually still using them. If you look at the weapons that Islamic State is fighting with today, a lot of the weapons are American weapons, American-made weapons. Why? Because these were weapons that were donated by the Americans to the uh, troops of Iraq, who then lost them or sold them. Another chunk are the weapons which have been in the region for decades, uh, been going from one conflict zone to another. And then you have a third group of weapons, I think, and these are the weapons which are being transferred more recently weapons which have been exported out of Eastern Europe and Southeastern Europe legally only a couple of months ago. I mean only for the stuff that we checked it's like over I, I believe 50,000 of tons because most of the arms are like um, 
grenades are um, ammunition for mortars, uh, mortar, mortar shells and mortars, um, AK-47, ammunition for them. So it's like, uh, it's, it's a really huge amount of, 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 of ammunition that it's, that it's transferred, transferred from, from this area to uh, Middle East. The governments of the Czech and Slovak republics, Bulgaria, Serbia and Croatia sold old stockpiles of weapons from the Cold War, as well as more recently produced weapons, to Saudi Arabia. It has been a windfall for these cash-strapped governments. When you have a buyer who is interested in buying large amounts of weapons and you do need to get rid of it because you cannot keep it forever, and if you can earn additional money next to it, that's excellent in terms of, you know, economic policies for all of those countries. The other difficulty is, is that justified? Should, is that legal? Is the huge question. And um, what justifies economic, you know, profits when it comes to human lives? In theory, you can do risk assessments and say, well, you know, how come somebody suddenly buying a type of ammunition that they don't usually use or a type of weapon system that they don't usually use. But ultimately you have to understand this is, you know, it's a business, it's a big business. Uh, and I'm not personally promoting it, I'm just trying to get understand that, you know, it's very difficult in situations where, uh, you know, the kind of armament industry is a big employer in a certain country, you know, and it's, you know, kind of faltering, it's kind of a social problem that you've got to tell them, well, you know, don't sell this to Saudi, you know, don't open up a new market especially when you have some of the big powers actually selling significant quantities there. Serbia is not the largest nor producer nor the export of the arms in the region. Croatia is. Uh, other countries in Central, Central Europe are also bigger than Serbia. What makes Serbia important is actually that it became the hub for the flights actually for the main place from, you know, picking up different sorts of weapons from different countries and then shifting it to uh, Middle East and Turkey. Belgrade Airport become a place where those, most of those guns are piled, then, you know, airlift to, to Turkey or to Jordan or to Saudi Arabia most, most commonly. There is a gray area somewhere. If you look at end user certificates, etc., it's a gray area. I mean, ultimately, the system could be tighter on that side. Um, but it also takes capacity, right? So sometimes you have to be also very, very realistic about how it works. You know, the US have very, actually very strong capacity on post-export controls. And they're very, very keen on ensuring that there is no diversion. So, you know, they will go back and control. But they also have a very extensive network of, you know, embassies that they can call on. If you have a small country like Montenegro, which altogether, I think, has about less than 30 embassies worldwide, and they sell somewhere where they don't. I mean, the, their ability to actually control where it went is much reduced, you know. What they usually have is, the, and what all of those uh, officials claim that they have is end user certificates. And they claim it's enough. Well, in fact, the document itself shouldn't be enough. And it's not enough in terms of breaking different type of laws. They are obliged to follow three type of law, national law, EU law, and ATT arms trade and treaty. And what they usually do is that they have that they own and user certificate, but they don't provide any additional information. Did they did a good enough, you know, background check of the buyers? Of course, the former Soviet bloc countries are not the only ones to supply weapons to potential areas of conflict. Belgium is a relatively small arms exporter from European perspective because we don't have a large defense industry. But when you look specifically at, at firearms and ammunition, we're top three in Europe. You have Germany, you have Austria, and you have Belgium. To a lesser extent, also Italy. Um, but when you look specifically at arms export of firearms and ammunition to the Middle East, Belgium is number one in Europe and it has been number one for years. So what I'm very keen actually to stress here is to kind of, we need to be a bit fairer to the countries in the Balkans. You know, there's small players on that market. I think they got a lot of bad press recently, which doesn't mean that, you know, 
they should have. So, I mean, generally, I think we advocate, you know, smaller sales of arms, etc. But we, I think we just need to be fair to them and understand that, you know, it's a very, it's a competitive environment, and it's one where when you have a big legitimate buyer, you know, it's a, you know, it's a big, you know, serious state. It's not a failing state. It's not, you know, it's not a state that has an internal, you know, conflict, etc. Then it's very difficult to make that argument. You shouldn't sell. Belgium's light arms company FN Airstal actually sold a batch of 200 rifles to Muammar Gaddafi in 2011. What happened to these and the millions of other Libyan weapons is a source of concern. What we've seen after the, the fall of Gaddafi is that many of these firearms ended up in the hands of all kinds of non-state actors. And we've seen that these weapons have been used across Libya, but also in other parts of North Africa. Some of these weapons might have even ended up in Palestine. So we're seeing a proliferation of small arms in North Africa, partly as a result of the collapse of Gaddafi's uh, reign, um, not just Belgian arms, but European arms. And these weapons are spreading to the south of the continent. But there's also fear in Europe that these weapons might actually end up going north, cr across the Mediterranean, and into the hands of criminals or even terrorists in the streets of Brussels, Paris, Amsterdam, and so on. States still employ private defense and security contractors and arms dealers as middlemen, however. There are middle, middlemen, actually. There are companies uh, that are dealing with that. From Serbia, it's usually CPR Impacts is one of the companies that is uh, dealing with those sorts of, um, those, those sorts of trade, I would say. Uh, there are other uh, companies which we are trying to um, uh, to you know target in different countries on some of those arms you can even see the dealers uh, name like Haloy from Bulgaria is one of as well you can see there there um, like a, you know a mark on the boxes of weapons that are distributed and then ended up in in Syria CPR Impex recently bought a stake in Montenegro defense industry a strategic move for a company that prefers to keep its dealings quiet. In Montenegro, MDI had approach to the port of Bar, which is one of the, in, especially in previous area, was one of the important hubs for arm, arms trade. Because the Bar is a um, privatized port and most of the arms trade went, went through that port. So from a logistical point of view, it's very much important uh, that you have some sort of, you know, possibility where you can like ship, ship, ship weapons. With Montenegro negotiating entry to NATO, having a base there seems logical. Um, CPR impacts uh, weren't able to sell weapons through Serbia that easily. And Montenegro actually opened the whole new chapter for them. So it, it's, you know, it's, um, it's a good business move. From the disarmingly peaceful countryside of Castellarquato, near Piacenza, Italy, a controversial dealmaker weaves his web of businesses across Africa. He has been described as the Lord of War and accused of attempting to sell half a million Kalashnikovs to Libya in 2005. But Vittorio Dordi denies it all. I started with the Congo in 1998 when I met, outside Congo, in Switzerland, a minister, the minister for petrol, Mpoyo, and he introduced me to the president, Laurent Desiree Kabila. And the president told me that the only resources available were those for building an air force. And since I spent 20 years in Russia and spoke Russian, he asked me to accompany a delegation to go and look for what they needed. I accepted the job, for which I have an official letter of engagement written by the ministry, and I was given a diplomatic passport for this job, and that's how I got into this field. Tutto si svolgeva praticamente all'estero. It all happened abroad. The suppliers were of diverse origins. The case that interested us were the 500,000 Kalashnikovs. Chinese-made Kalashnikovs, let's say, imitations. They came from a Chinese company that was well-known in the arms sector. 
nota nel settore degli armamenti. E destinazione in questo caso la Libia. Their destination was Libya in this case. Then there were the beginnings of a deal with Iraq for the same material, AK-47 Kalashnikov-type weapons and massive ammunition supplies. The first intercepted call that tipped off investigators was made in a city close to Perugia, where a small-time drugs dealer mentioned Dordi's name while discussing an arms deal in Libya. Dordi himself went to Libya to meet the potential buyer. The case was assigned to prosecutor Dario Razzi. E caso volle che questo soggetto dedito allo spaccio locale era... By chance, this person who operated in local drug peddling was a small player in a gang that dealt with other things, and he had a lowly role. One of his jobs was to go to Libya for reasons that were unclear. So we ordered a check on his luggage after the check-in and we found all kinds of weapons catalogues. These people who had been working in Libya for some time were looking for weapons and they called me when I was in the Congo. They called me several times saying, you work with Russia, give us a hand. And it is clear from the phone calls, and from the transcriptions, that I say, no, I am not interested. It's not something I am able to do. In any case, I represent a company that makes aircraft and helicopters. I know absolutely nothing about the Kalashnikovs. Prosecutors claim Vittorio Dordi is one of Italy's biggest arms traffickers, owning an arms dealership in Cyprus that represents warplane and helicopter manufacturers. His experience in working with the arms industry and sub-Saharan governments sheds light on who monitors what is really happening behind the scenes. I went to speak with the CIA. Basically what happened, the CIA said to me, do you have time to waste? We're talking about a country that released an end-user certificate for five guns and they were sent. What do you want to do? Nothing. If they really want to buy a half a million guns, then call us and we'll intervene. This is the first time an arms smuggling case has brought about convictions in Italy, with two of the dealers handed a two-year suspended jail sentence and Dordi himself being found guilty by the court of first instance, although he has appealed and is awaiting the final judgment. This business of the Kalashnikovs, they were speaking of a million Kalashnikovs at the beginning. It's unrealistic because the Chinese factory, the largest is Norinco, would have taken five years to make them without satisfying their other clients. So it's an unrealistic number of guns. It's as though Mercedes makes 500,000 cars a year, and I go and ask them, as a private individual, for two and a half million cars. Mercedes would say, sorry, but you have some problem. Fighter jets, MiG-25B models are available. These are contacts that never turned into anything. It's just to say that there was everything except for nuclear weapons. It came out that one of them has a minority stake in a company whose main shareholder was the main Russian aircraft producer. At that time, the Democratic Republic of the Congo was not under embargo, so was free to acquire whatever it wanted. And we created this air force, a small air force, typical of an African country, and I entered this sector by chance and became the sales representative for the Georgian company that produces the Sukhoi 25. The weighty indictment against Vittorio Dordi contains transcripts of telephone conversations between him and the original instigators of the deal. There are five telephone calls. In all the questionings of the others involved, they declared that I had nothing to do with this, that they did everything without me, they asked me for my help, but didn't get it, and they did everything without me. The result is that after eight years, I'm still waiting.
Often, the arms shipments arrive in small merchant ships at less important ports, with loading and unloading at secluded sites used by smugglers for centuries. The Haddad I was stopped close to Crete. Aboard were 5,000 pump-action shotguns, half a million 9mm rounds of ammunition and 46,000 cigarettes. Greek authorities believe it was bound for Misrata, which at the time was under the control of Libyan Dawn. The ship's last port of call was Iskanderun, Turkey, 50 kilometers from the Syrian border. The ship was later released after the intervention of the Turkish government, claiming that although Haddad I was bound for Libya, the guns were for Sudan. The role of Turkey in arms manufacturing and export on the very frontiers of Europe is controversial. In November 2015, another cargo of Turkish-made Winchester pump guns was intercepted in the port of Trieste with incomplete paperwork. The weapons were destined for Belgium and the Netherlands. Dozens of ferries and cargo ships enter the port of Trieste every week but monitoring what they carry is tough. Customs and port authorities rely on a formula that triggers checks on potentially high-risk vessels. Even the Italian government often turns a blind eye or even promotes the sale of weapons to countries under embargo. In 2001, a country like Libya under embargo wants to buy patrol boats but the Italian company that makes them can't sell them because they can't get an end-user certificate. So the government passes a decree that lasts six months that says that the end-user certificate is no longer necessary, so they are sold via an offshore company and reach their destination without an end-user certificate. The most widely trafficked weapon the world over is the AK-47, the Kalashnikov. It was invented by Igor Kalashnikov when he was wounded at the end of World War II. It is neither the most accurate nor the lightest of all weapons, but it is robust and can be broken down into a dozen pieces that are easily cleaned and smuggled. If you look at our neighborhood today, we can say that North Africa has a serious problem of proliferation of firearms. The Middle East, with all the conflicts going on there, it's very clear that there's a lot of weapons out there. And when you look at the eastern border, you see the Ukraine with a lot of an incredible proliferation of firearms. Now, at the moment, we don't see a lot of evidence of these weapons ending up back in the streets uh, here in Western Europe. But if we don't pay attention, if we don't take the necessary measures to prevent this, we might end up with a problem that's much bigger than the problem we have at the Balkans today. In fact, the whole of eastern and southeastern Europe is awash with AK-47s and their local derivatives. In terms of you know the illicit trafficking, the dangers for you know Western Europe is you know the proximity to this area, which you know is still a relatively recent post-conflict area, and these are you know remnants of war. So the danger is you know the the nature of the trafficking. So this kind of micro trafficking that's happening uh, currently, the porous nature of the borders, the fact that you know the EU borders have moved closer into the Balkans. Uh, and then it's actually really a simple supply and demand problem. You know, you have supply on this side, people, you know, willing to sell. And you have definitely an increased demand within uh, Western Europe for firearms, both in terms of organized crime, but also terrorism, as we've seen. Supply and demand are meeting each other. And this is where it gets interesting, because the perpetrators of these terrorist attacks are often linked to the criminal underworld. These were people that were often convicted for criminal violence, drugs trafficking, and so on. They spent time in prison, often radicalized in prison, and then used their criminal skills to acquire firearms that are very suitable for terrorist activities. While a Kalashnikov might cost 250 euros in Belgrade, it can be sold for 2,000 euros in a European city such as Brussels, where the firearms industry enjoys a long tradition, going back centuries. Concerns are growing that these weapons are increasingly being used for terrorism and organized crime. 
one of the things also to look into if you want to look at you know especially the european market internally right is the demand side and i think that hasn't been looked into enough uh you know there's always this pressure on okay the supply is coming but you know the supply wouldn't be coming if somebody wasn't buying it Gare de Midi, Belgium, is one of the places where gangsters and jihadists used to be able to buy weapons. The market for small arms and light weapons is estimated, conservatively, at $1 billion annually, with black markets adding another $200 million to the pot. One thing that we've noticed and one thing that we've targeted recently, and actually this method started uh, in Africa, is targeting what we call the super facilitators. These are, these are people that can do a various amounts of illegal activity from arms sales to narcotic sales to human smuggling. They have their hands in all sorts of different crimes. DEA, along with our counterparts, have started to target these organizations. And by targeting the organizations, not only are we disrupting drug trafficking organizations, we're disrupting terrorist organizations that are operating pretty much with impunity all over the world. The rise of West African organized crime, trafficking drugs, arms and people, operating alongside the terrorist organization Boko Haram, has added a new danger to Europe's streets, a new level of despair and instability in Africa. They are fighting in Nigeria also to, tell, to, tell, to ask me to do what is not under my religion, because I'm a Christian. Uh, I have a problem because my father is a politician and uh, he got himself into one mess or the other because of politics. So my family, generally, no one is at home now and my father is dead because of the same issue. Et la population voulait manifester, eh bien, ils, ils ont, ils, ils ont euh, arrêté la population de ne pas à, à se manifester. Et ces jours-là, ils ont commencé porte à porte, ils ont fait, il y, y, y avait des morts et plusieurs blessures. Et ils m'ont poursuivi, ils m'ont même tiré, j'ai reçu le bal. Ouais. People tend to see arms export to the Middle East as not connected to the illegal market here in Europe. But they are. As long as we keep exporting massive amounts of these weapons into the Middle East, and some of these weapons end up in the hands of all kinds of non-state actors, we have the risk that these weapons will eventually end up in our own streets. And this is where it gets interesting. And this is something that's not made. Uh, arms export control is seen as foreign policy. Fighting the illicit gun market is seen as an interior policy. And I think uh, we need to go beyond that. Uh, if we want to avoid uh, the Balkan scenario in a much worse uh, situation, uh, we need to start connecting internal security and external security. One of the documents that we, uh, that we found from our sources is directly in written saying that this can affect Serbia in many levels and that's the important bit. From one side, yes, you're providing profit, but from the other side, you're endangering your position in EU, which is one of the first Serbian priorities. Uh, you're endangering both of your position with EU actually and Russia because in this wartime thing Russia is on the other side, it's on Assad side and the weapons that Serbia is selling goes strictly to the, arm, uh, to the hands of rebels. So you're actually putting Serbia in both ways like, you know, it's, it's not safe. Ruthless arms suppliers who thrive in the grey area of a technically legal but morally dubious arms trade are fueling military violence across the Mediterranean, where the undetected passage of lethal cargo puts Europe's citizens at risk every day. The smuggling routes across the sea, between secluded ports where illicit goods, including arms, are trafficked, are today being overshadowed by state-sponsored deliveries of arms and ammunition. Millions of refugees from these proxy wars fueled by the arms trade are making the desperate journey to Europe. 